Hey, boys and girls. Um, well, before Christmas vacation, we were reading pictures of Hollis Woods, and we are down to chapter 15 and real close to the end of the book. So I'm going to start on chapter 15 and see how much I can do. Because I am just dying to find out what happens. Chapter 15, The Time with Josie. Outside it was almost dark. A sliver of moon curved over the old man's mountain, and a single star was just visible. A planet, Hollis, Stephen might say. Get your astronomy in order. If I cried again, the tears would freeze fast to my cheeks. The snow was so dry I could hear the creaking of my footsteps as I went past the holly bushes. No one could guess they were there, mounted up like soft white pillows, and the river in front of me had disappeared. I stood still to look at it all. I wondered how I could draw that to show the world underneath, the sharp, shiny leaves hidden in the snow, the river running fast and cold under the ice. In my mind was a picture of Beatrice brushing her hair off of her forehead. Drawing is a language, she had said. You must have to, you have to learn to speak it. In the distance was the faint sound of a saw. Someone must be cutting wood for a fire. I closed my eyes. Stephen and the old man turning their heads. Roger saw, they'd say. He must be in the apple orchard or hoppers finally got into that dead elm. No wasn't a saw. It was the sound of a snowmobile, probably on the other side of the mountain. A clump of snow fell off the roof of the house. I looked back at it and at the house where I wanted to belong. Huge icicles sun from, hung from the eaves, and suddenly I was so cold I couldn't stay outside anymore. Upstairs in my bedroom, I sat at the edge of the bed, shivering and waiting until I was warm, and, and then I went to my backpack and pulled out my pictures to spread across the bumpy white bedspread. I saw how much blue I had used in those summer drawings, blue for the river, blue for the old man's rugs, blue for Izzy's locket, and green, a smudge of a tree, a leaf, the edge of the mountain. Both colors I loved. The pictures I had drawn of Josie lay in the middle of the bed, Josie on the pier reaching for seagrass, Josie outside in her tree garden, shades of peach and lilac, Josie happy, Josie where she belonged. Josie didn't belong here. She belonged in her house. Whoops. Whoops. With Beatrice and Henry and the irritable pelican on her wall. She belonged near the ocean. I sat there for a long time, my head against the headboard, knowing what I had to do. I rubbed my hands, still icy cold. It was four miles to the telephone outside the grocery store. A long walk, but I could do it. I'd call Beatrice, ask her, beg her. We'd go home, Josie and I. Josie to Beatrice and me to another place. I looked at a half-finished picture of Izzy at the cemetery with a vase of daisies in her hand. What had she said that day? I wanted children for every corner of the house. And what else? There was something more she had said, something about Stephen and the old man. It's worse this summer. I'd have to stop thinking about Izzy, put all of them out of my mind. Before I left, I'd get rid of all the pictures of them, burn the drawings in the fire fireplace. I'd forget about Izzy and the old man and forget about Stephen. I stared down at the drawing of Izzy backing out of the door with my welcome to the family cake, and I saw something I hadn't remembered. The old man's hand on Stephen's shoulder. Me, catching my first fish, Stephen in front of me with the net and the old man smiling, but he is looking at Stephen, not me, looking and smiling. And another, Stephen hanging into the engine of a car, just the back of him visible with mismatched socks, and the old man with his hands on his hips, but his eyes soft. Beatrice is in my head again. What did she said to me one time? Sometimes we learn from our own drawings. Things are there that we thought we didn't know. And my lips were suddenly dry. I stood up, walked around to the other side of the bed. There they were in the boat, Stephen laughing at something the old man had said. How had I drawn all that and not seen it? 
Of course the old man loved Stephen. He was going to love him whether I was there or not. Had I given them up for nothing, the whole family? What do you know about a family, Stephen said in my mind. You've never had one. I remembered what Izzy had said then. They have to find their own way. I picked up another picture, me with candy in my mouth. Then there was something else floating just on the edge of my mind, something to do with the radio. Why the radio? Wait, I told myself. What had Josie said about wanting Santa to bring a radio? And then I had it, the two of us joking, Santa on a sleigh, I had said. Well, that was a hundred years ago. Now he comes on a, a snowmobile to bring the candy, Stephen, the pancakes, and the applesauce. I slid off the bed, the picture drifting out of my hand, my knuckles up to my mouth, the sweater hanging on the shed doorknob, Holly on the back step. Peace, Hollis. I felt as if I could hardly breathe. And then I was flying down the stairs, my, free, my feet barely touching the steps, skittering on the old man's shiny floor, coming to a stop in front of Josie asleep on the couch. I sat down next to her, one hand on Henry's rough fur. Wake up, Josie, I said. I want to ask you about Santa Claus. Okay, we have time to go to 16. Josie slept through my questions, her head nestled on the couch cushions, and Henry with her purring faintly with his eyes closed. She slept as I shook her, slept as I begged her, please, Josie, I can't wait to know, and slept as I offered her soup from a can, Izzy's candy, a cup of tea. And then at last I gave up. I looked at the black square that was the window. The moon had disappeared behind the old man's mountain and the star was gone. I went into the kitchen to make something to eat, the rest of the tuna with canned pineapple thrown on top and a few frosted flakes for crunch. God, that sounds disgusting. I ate it at the kitchen counter, wolfing it down, made hot chocolate and when it had cooled a little, put it under Josie's nose. Smells good, doesn't it? Just open your eyes, take a sip and talk to me. She smiled in her sleep as I kissed her forehead and then I went upstairs to bed, lying awake for a long time, feeling the tick of my heart in my own throat. Maybe the holly had just blown onto the back step. Maybe Josie had found the candy in the house. Maybe, maybe. But then as I fell asleep, I could almost hear his voice in my head. Merry Christmas, Hollis Woods. I was awake at the first light the next morning. It was a beautiful day with sunshine melting the ice on the window. I went downstairs and Josie was still asleep on the couch, but Henry was awake, stretching his skinny legs. I let him out and stood in the doorway, hugging myself, squinting at that glittering world, listening for the sawing sound of a snowmobile. <clears throat> and then Josie opened her eyes. I began slowly. Christmas was yesterday, I said. She smiled at me. Santa Claus is coming, I sang. To town, she finished. He came to us, I said. In all this snow, she said. But what did he look like? She ran her hand over her face, thinking. He looked cold, she said. <gasps> Wait. I think I'm getting what's going on. I wonder if you guys are. Somebody needs to message me and tell me. And he gave you the candy? One time, she said, when Beatrice and I were little, he brought mittens. Red for Beatrice, blue for me. We each swapped one. All winter, we wore one blue, one red. I went over to her and touched her hair. I'm going to call Beatrice, I said. Are we going home, she asked. Maybe, I said, I think so. Can you wait here? It's a long walk to the phone. I'll be gone most of the morning. I heard a few fragments of song as she wandered into the kitchen. If it takes forever, I will wait. 
I made breakfast for both of us, a heap of frosted flakes, and then I layered on sweaters, three pairs of Stephen socks, my jacket, and turned to Josie for one last try. Where did you get the candy, I asked. It's in a tin box, she said. Orange and lemon make your mouth wiggle. I'll be back. I opened the door, hearing the drip of melting icicles from the roof, and stepped back as Henry darted inside. Outside, I thought at first of taking the road. What difference would it make if I were caught? But it would make a difference. I wanted to call Beatrice first. I wanted to hear that she'd come to live with Josie. Darn it. My fingers are too cold to turn the pages. And suppose she doesn't, Stephen asked. I shook my head. She will. I think she will. I brushed him away, trudging along through the trees, listening to the call of the crows, the screech of the blue jays, and all the time I was listening for the buzzing sound of the snowmobile, telling myself I'd made the whole thing up, telling myself it wasn't Stephen. And what if it was Stephen, I asked myself. What would I say to him? It must have been almost 20 minutes later when I heard the faint sound of a motor. It could have been anyone, but still I ran toward the road, trying to pick up my feet in that deep snow. I saw him, a helmet on his head, thick gloves on his hands, bent over the handles of the snowmobile, and I stepped out onto the road just in time for him to see me and glide to a stop. I stood there biting my lip, feeling that river of tears coming at last, waiting for that brief second as he pushed up the visor. Hollis Woods, he said, where are you going? Stephen Reagan, I said, my mouth trembling. Happy birthday. And then we were laughing, both of us laughing instead of crying. Thank you for the candy, I said at last. Oh my God, this is such a good book. Looking at his face, thinner and bonier, something about his eyes seemed older. Horrible stuff, that candy, he said. And the holly branch. He tilted his head a little. Hollis Woods, he said again. How did you know I was here? He raised one shoulder, and there was a letter from the agency looking for you. I nodded, thinking about the mustard woman sending lost girl letters to every house I'd ever been in. I told Pop, Stephen swiped at his glasses. Hollis loves that house, I said. But did he listen? Of course not. I swallowed. You and the old man still arguing? If she loved that house so much, she'd be with us right now, Pop said. But I knew. I've been here every day except during the big storm. Mm -hmm. I was sh shivering in the cold. The wind blowing around us, my feet beginning to feel numb. We've been hoping you'd come all these months. Why not, Holly? He said. And then I was crying big sloppy tears, and I leaned against the handlebars, making terrible sounds in my throat, and I just couldn't seem to stop. And Stephen just stood there, his hands dangling in those huge gloves, and then he reached out and put his arms around me, pulling me toward him. The old man went down to Long Island when he heard you were missing. He's going crazy looking for you. He keeps going back and forth. Why didn't you tell him? I wanted to do that for you, at least that, give you time, he paused. You're famous. Your picture's in the newspapers. Pretty awful looking picture, if you ask me. And as he rattled on, I kept sniffling and wiping my eyes, and then I'd start to cry again. I knew you'd be safe. He took one arm off my shoulders to wave it around, as long as I kept an eye on you and your friend. You have a nerve, I said. You'd have starved to death without the food I brought. He frowned and began again. I still don't know why. I thought, I began and bit my lip. I thought I'd never tell him what I had thought about the old man not loving him. You were always arguing and I thought it had to do with, I waved my hands, with you? Oh, Holly, it doesn't have to do with anyone. I told you that, it's just the way we are. I started down the road, not a car in sight, the trees heavy with snow, bent and leaning. I'm a slob, he's neat. 
I forget, he remembers. We drive each other crazy, but it's all right. I ran my hands over my cheeks and tried to dry them. As simple as that, just the way they are. I told you, he said, his head tilted, his eyes smiling. You don't know about families yet. He leaned back against the snowmobile. He knew the accident was my fault. Ugh, I sighed. It was my fault. Everything has to be your fault all the time. I shrugged a little. After the accident, Pop said they told him you never stayed in one place very long, but he said we were different and that it must be something else, and that's what it was. You thought... I messed up the family. Wait till he hears this, Stephen said. Just wait. I watched the snow drifting off the trees. Old oh, man, I love you. Stephen rubbed my shoulders. He must have seen that I was shivering. I put the fishing pole away for you in the shed and looped the sweater over the knob. The fishing pole? I forgot about the fishing pole all this time. Ha! Hollis Woods, there's hope for you. I told you that. I'm going to spend next summer fixing up the old truck. What do you say? Want to help? Want to come home? I didn't say anything. I didn't have to. I climbed up on the back of the snowmobile. Take me to the telephone booth down at the grocery, I said. He gunned the, mo the motor and the snow spewed out behind us as we flew up the highway to call Beatrice. Okay, I'm going to read ahead. But this video is only six, it's 16 minutes, so it's too long if I put any more on here. But I'm going to be excited because I'm going to read ahead and I'm going to find out what happens. But you come back next week and find out. So long.